Hello, everyone. Welcome. You are watching Coffee and Conversations, part of Plenary Easton 2021. We are here today to talk about branding and marketing with a very interesting panel. Tim Curitan will be joining us in a few minutes. But right now, I want to introduce Crystal Mall, who has a gallery in Baltimore, as it also... <coughs> I think you won Plenary Easton one year. Did you? No, you, I never won Plenary Easton. But you've been but in Plenary been Easton. In, yep. um, and, uh, but you have a, she's an artist and a gallery owner. And then uh, Bill Nielsen here, who is, has been supporting Plenary Easton for 17 years. Uh, Bill, again, we're talking about branding and marketing. Bill is a, specializes in, or has, has had a career in corporate communications, public relations, public affairs, corporate coaching, and organizational vision and values, specializing in, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, Bill, corporate uh, communications and crisis management. Um, so we want to welcome both of you to this. Again, Tim Kiernan will be joining us after the break here. I had a question for the, for the this is going to sound kind of a silly question. When you... Before we introduce exactly who you are and what you what you do exactly, which we're going to kind of work backwards to, when you were a child, looking at your career, <clears throat> or imagining your career when you were a child, and you are where you are now, is this where you thought you would be when you were a child? Bill? <laughs> Not me. Um, I originally thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I'm glad I got rid of that idea uh, very early on. Um, then through high school and um, college, I was uh, into music. I had a several folk music groups, and um, we came along after the Kingston Trio, and I knew the Kingston Trio, the Brothers Four, and all of those. And I used to have a, um, a radio program um, in the uh, town where I went to college, Oregon State in Corvallis, uh, Oregon. And um, I went to business school at Oregon State, and I never heard the term public relations. Uh, it wasn't until um, I got into the Air Force, and I, I entered the Air Force uh, with a commission the day that I graduated from college, and eventually became the uh, base information officer at Andrews Air Force Base uh, over here outside of Washington and uh, handled the president's flight line press conferences and did, you know, we handled Vietnam War uh, demonstrators. And that began to give me a, a, an idea about the communications field. Uh, I, I went to uh, Boston University for a short course in public relations, and that's where I found the agency business and decided that's what I wanted to do. And uh, get out of the Air Force, um, Spent 17 years with a public relations agency working in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and at our headquarters in New York. And then uh, Johnson & Johnson came along, and uh, they had a, a project they wanted to give us, and I was asked to take the lead on it. And it turned out to be the product Splenda. Um, that uh, They had a compound that they were working through the FDA. To what year was this when Splenda came back out? Back in 86. 86, okay. And um, that's how I got to know them, and uh, they, I met the CEO, Jim Burke, at, who was the one who uh, was CEO during the, poison, the Tylenol poisoning uh, incidents in 1982 and 1986. And um, they started talking to me about coming to work for them, and I said no three times because I loved the agency uh, environment uh, and all the variety. Um, but I have to confess, they put an offer on the table that I couldn't refuse. So. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm sure they did, <laughs> I as they went, can. went to work for them, and um, very fortunately, I went to work for the next CEO, a man named Ralph Larson, who really understood the importance of reputation, integrity, and communications uh, in the success of a business organization. I reported directly to him, and he empowered me in so many ways, um, to uh, work through the company, to, uh, you know, always be on the lookout for behavior and decision-making that was consistent with the values of, of, the, uh, of the organization. And um, that's where I really found myself. And I... I that's um, wonderful. I had a lot of experience before that that 
prepared me uh, for the counseling role that I had. And I had learned, um, starting in the Air Force, uh, I had the ability to speak truth to power uh, without being intimidated uh, by it. And that's... Um, that's a pretty that's, special gift there. It, it is something. And, you know, working with... I, I counsel a lot of younger people who are coming into this career field. Okay. And I said, you know, you're, everything you're doing right now is beginning the process of the, building a foundation on which you will provide counsel in the future. So don't just do a project and move on to the next one. Turn around and, and, and be mindful of the lessons that you're learning and kind of make note of it as you go. And that's the way you develop, um, you know, your sense of self-confidence because you know you can go into any situation and be comfortable. Um, that's well, that's going to be I'm very... I'm sorry, I, I didn't... No, that was great. Probably, it was great. Probably not a part of this program, but <laughs> you hit on a note and it just sets me off. <laughs> no, no, no. That's the, I really uh, would encourage anyone who is watching this, if they want to come down, we're going to talk for about an hour. But I think this conversation is going to get very, very interesting today uh, based on the knowledge of, of these three guests. Crystal... You want to talk about your, you know, are you where you thought you would end up uh, when you were a child thinking about this? Um, Bill wanted to be a, a lawyer and a disc jockey, it sounds like. <laughs> well, I was fortunate when I was young that um, both my parents are artists, and my father on Saturday mornings, we would have actually art class. And out of the several children in our family, I was the worst one. And But I watched my father one day draw this rose in front of my face, and I thought... If I could ever do that. And so it was like, it's, it's these little things along the way that like sparked my interest in what I do. And, um, and so I just started saying, I want to be an artist. Like that was kind of it. I had a great teacher in junior high. She taught me perspective. And then, you know, I paint a lot of buildings and street scenes and I out and out on plein air, just outside all the time. But um, so that was another step um, then I went to college. I learned how light and shadow, you know, were created by, or all the cool colors and the shadows and the warm colors and the light from one great teacher. So I had these great little, you know, instances in my life that sort of got me on this path. But during the during that path, my father ran an advertising agency in Norfolk, Virginia. Really? So I started working there since I was like 14 years old. Yeah. So that was really helpful moving into my art career because not only did I like learn to start to learn to paint and paint you know fairly well but I also could market myself right. and that was key to actually when I when I first um, started painting full-time which was 30 some odd years ago I started to show in galleries and then I was like nobody's advertising it like the way I want to do it nobody's selling it the way I want to do it so I started just managing my own career and I felt like, well, you know, I just thought that was the best way for me to proceed. And then um, I ended up in the gallery business 11 years ago, kind of by accident. Um, the space where my gallery is, which is in Federal Hill in Baltimore, this one man owns these three buildings. And the one emptied because of the crisis in 2009. It was a little gift store. And he said, could you put a painting in the front window so it doesn't look awful for the holidays. And I put a bunch of paintings in, put lights on the ceiling, put my name on the front door totally legally, and opened up in four days. And we <laughs> were going to do this for till the end of January. A pop-up thing or whatever. Yeah, and this was before pop-ups. So it was just right. like, let's just, because I thought, Filling the space. How, do you, how do you run a gallery? How do you paint full time? How do you have a life outside of that? Um, haven't still figured out all of those things, but I've gotten better at it. Um, but that's how I got into the gallery business. Um, had people help me out part time, and now I have a wonderful gallery manager who's been with me for seven years. So, um, you know, it's a constant learning, changing, adapting, especially to this new world in which we find ourselves, and especially what's happened this past year learning to stream things, which our first time of, at that was abysmal, but we got a little better along the way. Sure. So, you know, that's sort of how I got to where I am. When I was a kid, I fell in love with making art, and then I just 
kept trying to get better at that part. Right, okay. Yeah. Now, Crystal and Bill, please hop in here. You said you are not a um, uh, social media sort of guru. guru. <laughs> Bill, you were saying before we got on that everything's changed because of social media. Well, it, it, it really has. Um, some would say um, <laughs> social media is to blame for many of the um, you know, the issues that we face in society today. You know, on, on the other hand, um, social media has informed people um, uh, in greater detail about so many uh, issues, and it, it certainly became a driving force for big companies um, because there's so much information now available to consumers about consumer product companies and, you know, all kinds of companies. And um, people are much more mindful and aware now of who's behind the products they are consuming or, or, or using. And um, if you're in a company and having all of those informed consumers, uh, you know, you have to be mindful of the, your behavior and um, the decisions that you make um, if you want to ensure integrity. Uh, in, and um, have the kind of reputation that, 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 that you want. And a lot of that comes from social media. Crystal, uh, does that matter when you're trying to sell a painting? <clears throat> what, what Bill just explained there. And I'm sure, Bill, you can bring it back around. But as a practical gallery owner, is it just a beautiful painting that you... And that's... Because he's exactly right. I mean, you can learn everything, everything about an artist, even. Which you could, anyway. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's really important, and I probably don't even think about this as much as I should. I think we just do it, is when we're posting about artwork or we're talking about, you know, a piece of art that we're selling for somebody or even one of my pieces or, or watching a process of a painting being made, um, everything we put out there, we work really hard at making sure that um, I guess that it's all very positive, like, and how we want, how our integrity wants to be put out there. And um, it's amazing, again, that's sort of the worst part of social media is that, you know, you get one person that writes a bad review on something, and, you know, and you got to look at, like, well, okay, you have 50 great reviews, but then you have this one. How much those words can hurt. Um, you hope all those people that are saying the good things all help. But, um, but we work really hard at everything we put out there is um, really classy, um, represents the artist well, represents us well. Um, and, uh, and I feel like, you know, one reason I work so hard to hold on to my, and it's a tiny little gallery, is because I feel like this is a service to the community as much as anything. Sure. I mean, it's And it's a hard one for people to get to understand actually being a service to community, but it certainly is. It, um, I mean, I, I, I think I, if my little gallery and closed down in Federal Hill, it would be devastating to, you know, the the other <clears> galleries <throat> that are in Baltimore to my gallery. You know, not I, devastating. But I really think that's a great um, attitude to have or frame of mind the service to the community because that will affect... Uh, your decision making around everything that you do. And, right. And I say that again, Bill. Can you say that again a little louder? I just the idea uh, that she is providing a service to the community and thinking about that provides a framework around which you know she can decide all kinds of issues. And um, uh, I, 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 I mean, it, it means you're going to have sensitivity to the community, right, and their issues and their needs. And you want to respond to that. And I think that's a very healthy way of thinking. Well, really? so, um, when Bill, she's talking about, we're going to take a break here in a second, Scott. We'll ask this last, uh, Nick, we'll ask this last question and then take a break. Um, when she's talking about making these posts on Facebook, I, I, you, I know you're familiar with Facebook, and she's saying, well, we're always trying to be classy. We're always trying to be positive. A lot of times, and you, and you have to be present in those in those. Uh, uh, mediums to stay relevant. So you have to keep posting. 
but sometimes you feel like you're, it's almost too Pollyanna. And I was wondering if you could offer any, uh, and when you talk about all of the things that make up a, a, a business with integrity, are there other ways you could take that post? Are there other values you could put in the post online that would help transcend the experience to the person on the other end, rather than saying, oh, here's just another nice post from the Crystal Mall Gallery? Are there ways you can frame those posts with integrity to keep the viewer, to really get that message across to the viewer and, and brand yourself in that way? Yeah, uh, that's a, a very complex question and issue. Um, as we were talking earlier, um, uh, the, our environment has changed so much uh, over the past, actually, four and a half, five years, but mainly over the last year and a half because of the, uh, you know, the pandemic and the devastation in the economy and so many people who were out of work for so long and, and um, you know, try, trying to come back that I, I, I think... Um, being mindful of all of those changes and the issues that have emerged uh, as a result, you know, certainly uh, racism, but but um, uh, issues around climate change are just hammering, you know, uh, every day. Uh, sustainability in terms of the uh, the use of resources, um, diversity, inclusion. Um, Inequity that exists. Um, I mean, those those are those are all, those are all issues. So, if if um, and the reason I mention that is that that art to me is um, as important um, uh, 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 as a communication vehicle as the written word to me. Art is a representation, you know, imagery. Um, and I have huge respect for the talent, uh, uh, you know, you and others who are able to, you know, put things down on a on a board that is frameable. I can't do that. I can I can use a camera and take a picture, but I can't I can't do that that work. And I, I think that's a real gift. And and uh, those who are trying to, um, you know, build or sustain a profession by uh, becoming plein air artists or other artists and selling their work, um, as we were talking earlier, social media is a terrific avenue uh, uh, for that. I I wanted to, if I can just mention... No, I'll, I'll hold that for the next segment, but right. we'll, okay. we'll, 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 we'll get to that. Because, okay, but, uh, but I want to pick up on what you said about the artist, because uh, Nick, we're getting ready, and the art um, being incredible to sort of watch. We're going to take a break now. And I went last night, I went through and watched what we filmed yesterday. And Nick has created these really, really well done, um, fast time lapse painting videos. And you can actually, if you watch two or three of them in a row, you can really start to see how each painter does it differently. And he's got some great music underneath of it. So we're going to be right back in a few minutes talking with Bill Nielsen. Um, <laughs> Tim Kieran is going to join us, and uh, Crystal Mall is here from her gallery in Baltimore. But take a look at these videos. Don't, and then, well, you can go up and get a fridge, something from the fridge, because I think they're going to last for two or three minutes anyway. But take a look at these. It's really, really uh, well done videos. Thank you guys. We'll be right back.
Yeah, you have like you just slap it in your Velcro? <laughs> yeah, my Velcro with my little baby. Some weekends seem to last forever when nonstop applications become nonstop discovery. And in the heart of Maryland's eastern shore hides an annual haven of art, instruction, and entertainment. The country's largest outdoor painting competition, Plein Air Easton. There, you can trade in the ordinary routine for an energetic festival, exchange housework for a night or two at a bed and breakfast, and swap never enough time with we should do this more often. Take a weekend for yourself to explore, to paint, to experience something new. Your immersive art weekend begins at pleneareaston.com. One of America's most beautiful stretches of road weaves through the heart of Talbot County. And for one week every July, that road comes alive with America's best representational painters. Now in its 17th year, Plein Air Easton is the nation's largest and most prestigious outdoor painting competition and festival. Not only is there incredible art to discover in Easton, the hub of the festival, but we're also expanding our events in Oxford, St. Michael's, and Tillman Island with exhibits all across Talbot County, each evolving with fresh paintings throughout the festival. There has never been a better time to explore the area's tidal shorelines, verdant fields, and vibrant small towns. Make plans to be inspired again through the arts and to take home a painting of Talbot County's picturesque landscape to memorialize your immersive art adventure. It's all here at Plein Air Easton. To start your art road trip, visit pleinairesteon.com. Welcome everyone back to Coffee and Conversations, Planner, part of Planner East in 2021. I'm Tim Wagon, your host. Thank you for joining us. We're joined because um, of the traffic in Easton, probably, I'm sure. <laughs> it's more the life I've chosen, but... Uh, Tim, you're always on the run. You know, you're... Oh my goodness. Well, I apologize for missing the first segment. I'll watch it uh, on <laughs> yeah, YouTube, right, but, right. Um, but thrilled to be here and, and really honored to be a part of this uh, panel, so thank well, you. Tim, I we want to just tell everybody what you, you've, your reason. You're, you've got at least three successful businesses now, or three businesses in town, and you're building a building. And I hate to use the S word, actually. We we don't use the S word, uh, you That's know, good. success, but because cool. uh, it all has to happen again tomorrow, kind of thing. We're uh -huh. open seven days a week, and uh, with Rise Up, that's been 16 and a half years. Uh, so. Uh, and I, I came to this whole thing pretty honestly. I, I was a sociology undergrad. I have a master's degree in education, which I often forget about. But that was my ticket to the Peace Corps. Peace Corps led me to coffee. But I had never taken a business course in my life, never knew anything about marketing and branding, and sort of had to learn it as I went. And uh, so it's been a process. But funny enough, of all the things, of all the topics uh, involved with Rise Up, it's, it's really marketing and branding that uh, gets me the most excited. And, and so when you mentioned uh, coming here to speak about that, uh, that was an area that I feel like maybe I do have something to say, you know. Well, good. Tim, what, what excites you about it? Well, you know, years ago, I, I was uh, trying to learn everything I possibly could about coffee and 
uh, from being to business to beverage and going to every coffee conference that I possibly could and sitting through session after session after session, sometimes the same session, repetitive times, often the marketing and branding sessions. Uh, and once I sort of grasp that marketing and branding is everything, and everything you do is marketing and branding. Once that really sunk into me, uh, it's a little overwhelming because, boy, then that means everything, including being late to a uh, uh, talk here at the Avalon. But the, um, you know, it's everything you do, and everything you do is branding. So, wow. But when that fully hit me, then, you know, uh, it was sort of an epiphany at that point because. Uh, then taking a look at every aspect of Rise Up, how we engage the customer, how we look to the customer, uh, but also I heard uh, social media mentioned, and then that's really come about. We started in 2005, and I would say social media really took a hold in, in uh, 2007 and became uh, sort of this new word of mouth. And I credit uh, that social media platform. We've taken it very seriously from the get-go. We've put a lot of energy towards it, um, and and I, I believe uh, part of the ripple effect of Rise Up and now Rude is is certainly uh, because we've we've dedicated ourselves to it. Where did the name come from? Oh, well, funny enough, two days ago, my buddy from the Peace Corps, uh, my almost like a brother to me, was here visiting, and we were kind of reflecting on this because. He had his whole life mapped out when we were in the Peace Corps together. He said, I'm going to marry the, my girlfriend, Mandy. I'm going to go to medical school. I'm going to practice law in Hawaii. All of that has happened. And I said, well, I was thinking about opening a coffee business. And he said, you know what? I have this idea of this perfectly sustainable coffee uh, shop that I would open in Hawaii, and I would call it Rise Up Coffee. And I said, wow, <laughs> holy cow. Well, you're going to do the medicine thing. Maybe I could have that name. And, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the rest is history. But, you know, he, uh, for that, uh, gets all the free rise up he wants. And all the, he loves the name, of course, loves the merchandise. And it's a pretty cool thing. But it is rise up. I mean, I, I thought, well, they're, they're talking about rising up, the first thing you do to get your head together is have a cup of coffee. Right. That's that very, I'm glad you brought that up. Wow. Because, <laughs> yeah, there's so many connotations of rise up. Right. And actually, we celebrate all of them. And I haven't, you know, found one or met one that I don't really appreciate. The waking up to meet the day is a really cool. The political aspect, of course, is something that we don't shy away from. Uh, but, you know, uh, even, you know, spiritual connotations is, is you know, fine by us, but uh, really it, uh, it's a powerful name. There's, there's no doubt about it, and people connected with it straight away. Uh, they would walk in to rise up, and before they ever tasted the coffee, they would say something like, oh, I love this place. This is, you know, this is my place, and I say, well, you know, try the coffee. You know, we're pretty proud of it, but uh, so it's, <laughs> it's connected, that's for sure. Um, I want to move this, uh, just, I want to see if you guys can, um, Crystal, when, when you bring in a painter, uh, is it important to you that they have, uh, beyond the work being good, that there is a a sort of, you know, sort of ethical uh, uh, side to them, and or, or how how does that how does that go about for you? Um, most definitely, um, you know, as I said, the galleries we've had it for eleven years, and um, you know, through that time, again, I didn't take any business. You know, it's like it, it's all just sort of been a learning process along the way. And, you know, at the beginning, we did a lot of, like, call-to-entry shows, and I knew several artists from being in, like, Plein Air Easton and other events, and so, you know, pulled on that resource. Um, I will say we've slowed things down a little bit, a lot this past year, um, with, with how we actually host shows and that sort of thing. But during this whole process, especially the first five, six, seven years, um, you know, I really started to get to know so many artists and know them well, and 
And it really comes down to respect. Like if I don't respect them personally or if they don't respect me personally, I don't have their work in my gallery. Um, because I want to sell, I want to sell artists, I, you sell the artist as much as you do their art. I mean, you sell a fabulous painting, but I want to be able to say this person is like somebody you would really want to know, a good person. They show up on time, they're respectful, they're, you know, they're good. And so we really, we, I always say we don't deal with any, you know, pompous artists, you know, except for me, maybe. But no, um, except for, we're all we're all somewhat self-absorbed. We have to be, or else we wouldn't be good at what we do. But there's a limit of of like being respectful of the art of the gallery. And um, you know, when it comes back to like social media, more so and more so, like if we post something, we the only way this is all going to be extremely successful is if each one of those artists post what we're doing. And that, you know, several of the artists that we show on more or less a regular basis list us as one of their galleries. Sure. So it's, but back to your first question, yeah, it's so important that the people that we represent, we have great respect for. Bill, this is going to sound cliche. Is image everything? Oh, well, I, I, I think I was, as you were talking, I was just thinking about, um, uh, the, let me ask the question because I don't know. It seems to me if you're an artist, what you want to do is um, continue to add to the, the value of your work um, so that you appeal to collectors and that ultimately, um, yeah, the paintings that you have done increase in value because of, uh, of the name. Is that right? Is that how that works? I'm, I'm not in the field, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we're dealing with an artist that's fairly new to the to the scene, um, yeah. and they start talking to us about pricing um, and and trying to get their their name out, um, we first first of all we always say you should always start on the lower end because you can always go up, but you shouldn't go in saying, oh, each one of my pieces is ten thousand dollars, and then go, oh, nobody's buying them, so we're going to drop it down. Um, you know, it takes years and years. Well, in my case, anyway, to um, to you know find all those collectors and build that. Um, I'd say one big plus of being being a plein air artist is you meet so many of your clients on the street. I mean, I literally paint only on on the street. So um, through the years, I've built that up. Um, so artists, you know, they need to. They need to get their work out, whether they hang it in their dentist's office or a restaurant or my gallery. Um, they need to get it online. Um, you know, the thing is, we're all barraged with so much online that it's hard to, like, weed through it. So I'm one of these people who actually thinks I'm a little old-fashioned, also being in the advertising business way back, that it's like, we still do print media. We still do some radio. We still do social media. I mean, now we do social media. We stream things. I mean, we're doing so many different things, um, and the artists need to be. If but, we're but there's a, but there's a, there's a. When we talk about marketing and branding, I mean, they're just talking about doing things. But there's a, you're trying to also send an image across or an, a value system, belief sort of across. Is that true, Tim? Oh, for sure. Yes. I mean, I, I think. In a word, uh, it's connection. I mean, if if uh, if it's anything, it's connection for us. And you know, uh, and it can't be, to my knowledge, cannot be uh, faked or falsified. I mean, it really has to be a connection. And for us, it, it actually starts uh, at the beginning, which is with our coffee farmers for us and the relationships that we form at Source, and then. Uh, our team of folks, uh, you know, that we have with us at Rise Up, uh, and then we we uh, can connect with our customers by way of our product, by way of our people, uh, by way of our approach. But uh, for me, it's it's really about creating that connection, um, definitely through uh, you know our social media platforms. Uh, you know, we're able to sing our song. Uh, it, explain by way of mostly photographs, uh, you know, who we are as a company, what we stand for, the things that, that we respect, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's led to a very strong connection with our customers. Bill, even in Johnson & Johnson, 
Are they trying to connect that way from the, it's, it's, you know, you're talking about thousands and thousands of employees and trying to make sure that all of them sort of like have at least portray the value system coming down from, I think there was one person you said who wrote the values for Johnson and Johnson. Yeah. Um, that situation is a bit different from, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a very diversified, it's the largest healthcare uh, organization in the world. Uh, but uh, from the beginning, um, the business model was to um, to have affiliate companies who owned the branded and produced the branded companies. The corporate entity, Johnson & Johnson, doesn't produce any products, and, and uh, there isn't anything marketed under the Johnson & Johnson name. Uh, what, what we project, though, is that... Um, uh, that's where the, the values are established and, and the disciplines uh, for the business organizations. We had over 200 operating companies, and they own all, all the brands. Uh, um, and and um, But you were in charge of all this, weren't you sort of at well, the I, top? Well, I, I was in charge of, of you know, the, the reputation of the corporation, but also the communication of the corporate entity, uh, since there's only one stock, for example. Uh, but... Um, the company it was a, a corporate citizen, so we had to become involved in a lot of issues uh, that were, you know, very important. And that was where my work was. It wasn't so much in branding. In fact, um, uh, people wanted to refer to Johnson Johnson as a brand, and I kept saying, no, it's not a brand. And the uh, CEO I worked for, we were discussing this one day, and, and uh, he said, um, the issue we're after is trust. And... Um, that, 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 that's what we're trying to earn, is trust for all of our products and all of our companies. So the signature, Johnson & Johnson, isn't a brand or a trademark. He said, it's a trust mark. And um, I said, Ralph, <laughs> you got it. Tim, that's is that exactly too old school? It. Is that old school? Oh, my goodness, no. I, I, uh, yeah, I was just reflecting to our company uh, core values and... And really, we, uh, some years back, tried to tie everything that we could down to these core values of, of Rise Up. And uh, it really was amazing how everything did sort of tie down. That, that We tried to figure out what was making Rise Up so special for folks. And, uh, you know, s sometimes uh, that can be tricky. But when we took a look at our core values and saw how everything sort of, uh, all the pieces went into place, but, uh, you know, that trust word is, is so important. I mean, I think uh, that's what's developed over the years. We were specialty coffee on the very, very, very most remote fringe of uh, the farthest away from the epicenters of uh, specialty coffee in this, in this country. Uh, here we were on the eastern shore. Um, but over time, cup by cup, that trust developed, and I'll never forget when I looked out at our line and saw that it wasn't just the teachers and lawyers, or uh, it was the heavy water carriers of our society that were lined up. It was the watermen, the trades people, and over time, word had gotten out that you could you could sort of trust rise up, that you could actually be comfortable there, and and uh, and so that's been a very special thing for us. Great. I'm going to ask one more question, Nick. We'll go to break here in a minute, Crystal. What type of bad advice do you hear people giving people in your, in your field? What type of things that are, that are bad recommendations that you've heard people say? Um, do you mean to other artists? Or yeah, to, yeah, to other, yeah to, to other artists. Or what, what's bad ideas that you've heard people come back to you and say, oh, they told me I should do it this way and that sort of thing. Um, well, actually, that's usually kind of it. Um, if somebody else, who's someone who's creating artwork to have other people try to influence their work too much is, to me, usually a bad idea. Um, not that suggestions aren't good, but, like, my work specifically, if somebody comes up and says, oh, well, maybe you should do it this way, or maybe you should go around this corner and see this building or this scene. And, again, not that that's always a bad idea, but I think as artists, you often are drawn to the kind of pieces you want to make and you should be very true to the pieces that you want to make when you're competing in a situation like this it's like oh what 
what will the judge what does the judge's work look like and maybe I should maybe think about this painting instead of this one that I would be more honest and true with I never really look at who the judges are I don't look to see what categories I might win in a in a competition it's like I think the best thing to do is be as true to yourself as an artist as you can be instead of letting those other influences and my father said this to me years ago, and he's an advertising man, but he's also a painter. And, and it was just like, don't overthink it. And not that you shouldn't be doing a lot of thinking, but if you overanalyze some things, then you're kind of almost stopping the process. Tim, Bill, did the pandemic change anything on the marketing, branding side in terms, I, well, you were still going, but you were not, you couldn't go into your place. Well, if I, if I could, we did close for uh, two months. Two months. And actually, I, I uh, talked about this in our uh, post when we came back, was that social media really kept us connected to uh, our customer base and really kept us um, going. Uh, I mean, we, at one point, we went from 200 some uh, amazing individuals down to seven you know, and over that two month period. And, but it was that direct feedback, uh, that encouragement that we were seeing by way of social media. Uh, we also put out some specials by way of social media for, uh, you know, a local uh, free shipping uh, deal that, that uh, really was, uh, uh, you know, found a home with, with folks that couldn't then visit Rise Up. They could order it uh, online. Anyway, uh, it was truly our lifeline during during those two months, and uh, you know I'll, I'll never forget that. And also, you know, when we didn't expect that that uh, March twenty second to close our doors, but it seemed like the right thing to do. And uh, when we announced it on social media, basically all heck broke loose in the most spectacular, heartwarming way. I mean, we had lines that just. I had mentioned to our managers, hey, you may want to return to your stores if you can get there. I had no idea what, what was about to happen in the next five hours. And that, that all started with an announcement on social media at noon that, that Sunday, March 22nd. Right. Bill, the pandemic change anything? Well, are you talking about the Johnson & Johnson experience? Just in, in, in whatever your expertise well, is. You know, being in the healthcare business and in... in Every aspect of, of healthcare, um, th th there were great demands for a lot of the products, but not in certain areas like medical devices, because uh, many surgeries were canceled or put off, you know, because uh, people didn't want uh, to go into hospitals. So that affected the business, um, um, but they made up for it in different ways. But. I mean, that business is totally different than yours. Totally different, that's you're, right, right, right. You're doing a direct <laughs> to consumer, where, whereas a, a, a producer like Johnson & Johnson is making products <laughs> which are delivered to the consumer through drugstores and, and, and others, not directly by the company. So it's a very different kind of a thing. Uh, but um, part of the success of, of uh, CVS or, you know, people who market those products uh, is the reputation of the individual branded products. And uh, so the company has a, a responsibility to maintain that trust and, um, and consumer confidence uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to maintain the successful marketing of those products. So it's a, it's a very different... The Johnson... Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. I was just going to say uh, one more point about what happened during COVID times. You know, we pivoted so hard towards our online uh, platform. Thankfully, we had invested in it prior to COVID substantially. But uh, that pivot, leaning into it, really putting so much emphasis behind it in that two-month period. I remember coming out of it and taking a look at our uh, profit and loss for the whole company. And talk about loss, we were down 93% as, uh, you know, for our yeah. base. But we were up. 93 percent it was like unbelievable almost to the up 93 percent oh, where say, uh, online so it was like we were down 93 percent in our stores but up 93 percent uh online and it was almost i think it was like 50 dollars difference or something mm. it was unbelievable really still unbelievable to me right now. so you were delivering 90 up 93 percent for for great 
Correct. Our online store That's... shot up 93% over a previous year, and our stores were down 93% at the same exact moment. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Unbelievable. That's fantastic. You have, you have so many opportunities with your, your brand. I mean, have you thought about franchising, for example? Um, have you thought about other products to bear the rise Shark Tank, name? maybe? I'm older than I look. I, I, uh, I'm sort of I'm easing into a, a transitional time in my life where I, I have a son, and I just sort of, I, I'm really, really blown away by everything that's happened with Rise Up. I mean, we were just trying to carve out a life around some work kind of thing, and uh, next thing you know, this uh, Rise Up has, has gone bananas in, in a really beautiful way, but... Uh, we have considered all those things and still will consider them moving forward. But um, I remember uh, uh, someone just recently had seen Rise Up years ago and was desperate to get Rise Up in one of their shopping centers and that sort of thing. And he had told his wife that he wasn't going to rest until and if he could ever get a hold of this company, he would put uh, 10,000 of them around the country. Right. And, uh, now has come to know that he would have really messed that up, you know, <laughs> because that's just not who we are. And uh, so right now I'm in this this phase where I really love that we live over here, that we uh, that Rise Up is based over here and, um, you know, that we distribute kind of that way. And and uh, we'll see what the future holds. But uh, for right now, it's it's uh, certainly enough to kind of keep us going and we're thrilled about it. Do you have to manage the issue of um, the working environment from your coffee bean growers? Um, oh, definitely. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. So all of our coffee is uh, from the get-go. Uh, we made the commitment to go all fair trade organic. Uh, you know, every single bean that's ever been roasted or served with Rise Up is fair trade organic sustainable coffee. Um, you can punch holes in the system, but truthfully, with our relationships at Source, we see the impact of, uh, you know, what fair trade actually means. We see the impact of what organic actually means, which is that, you know, coffee is the third most pesticide doused crop in the world, um, and this is a family uh, affair down there. So the the Soil uh, in a commodified uh, coffee farm is just toxic, and you know, and and what you see is uh, high cancer rates. Um, and on the organic coffee farm, the complete, you know, opposite of that. So very proud that we we made that commitment from the get go. Um, and you know, when I got into coffee, it was really the global connection bringing the world to us by way of coffee and to establish these relationships at source and call them friends. I mean, the, when I look at our coffee bags, they don't just represent countries of origin. They represent human beings, their families, the villages, you know, and it's, you know, it's a power, powerful thing. We should, sure. we should compare notes offline, but I did um, consulting work for the Mars family for quite a number of years oh, wow. in chocolate. Faces oh, the same, uh, Very similar, many of the same yeah. issues yeah. as coffee bean growers, you know, all over the world. Uh, chocolate uh, is grown mainly in developing countries, and so there are always issues about, you know, children <laughs> working. Um, oh, yeah. And the family wanted to be very careful of that, you know, that they were doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it would be interesting to compare it notes be, on yeah, two different ingredients. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break uh, here. We'll be right back with the last segment with Chris Tamal, Tim Carradine, and Bill Nielsen. This is Coffee and Conversations, Plenary East in 2021. We'll be right back.
I'm gonna leave it. Yeah. Here they go. <laughs> Some weekends seem to last forever when nonstop applications become nonstop discovery. And in the heart of Maryland's eastern shore hides an annual haven of art, instruction, and entertainment. The country's largest outdoor painting competition, Plein Air Easton. There, you can trade in the ordinary routine for an energetic festival. Exchange housework for a night or two at a bed and breakfast. And swap never enough time with we should do this more often. Take a weekend for yourself to explore, to paint, to experience something new. Your immersive art weekend begins at plenairisten.com. Welcome back to Coffee and Conversations, part of Plenary Easton 2021. We're in the Armory Building downtown Easton. Should mention, I guess I've done this for the whole show, that there are also satellite galleries in Oxford, in Tillman Island, and in St. Michael's that will run through Wednesday. Then the whole exhibit will come back to Easton for a great weekend. Uh, thousands, almost a thousand paintings will be done this week here. And um, there will all be between the Academy Art Museum and the Armory, the Don't Forget Local Color, which is across the street at Christ Church, and the kind of famous quick draw competition that takes place Saturday will draw several thousand people downtown. Outdoors, which I think is a little bit more important this year than maybe in other years. Um, so I want to welcome back Crystal Mall, Tim Curitan, and Bill Nielsen to Coffee and Conversations. Guys, this is our last segment. Tim, it was great catching up. It was a great story, and I think that when they... Again, one of the best branders and markers in, in, in Easton for your stuff. So really appreciate you coming by. Oh, my goodness. It's a thrill. Um, Crystal, if you if someone were coming into to your shop, and I'd like Bill and Tim to kind of maybe add on to this, how should they, as an artist, because we are talking about plein air, and plein air is the hub of everything that we're doing here. And we'll get back into some sort of more general questions in a second, but maybe if you guys could add your expertise to this. As an artist, if they were coming in, what, what would they do to try to impress you in terms, with the same sort of passion that these gentlemen have for, for their things that they've done in, in their careers? What would, what, would a, what would an artist do to impress you to get into a gallery? To start the process, to get it going? To... Right, so um, it might be easier to say what they shouldn't do. They actually shouldn't walk into a, a, anybody's gallery with their portfolio or their phone and say, wait, let me show you my work. They should not do that. They should not do that. Because um, that's, that's just assuming that I'm, I'm not in the middle of doing 20 other things, which I always am. OK. Um, but it, it's OK to come in and introduce yourself as an artist and say, hey, you know, I like painting this kind of work. And how, how do you want to, you know, how can I show it to you? And you can either make an appointment. A lot of times what I do is I ask people just to send me files. And if it's, if it's work that maybe wouldn't fit into something we're doing now, it might be work that we will do a show that just says anything goes. And that's open to, like, anybody. So coming in, introducing yourself is a great thing. Coming to some of the events, getting to know, you know, the person that owns the gallery personally is, is helpful. Um, but I think really just, uh, and then checking in every once in a while, like just because you either send in or email, because sometimes people will still send in like printed images, um, one time, like you can't just drop it there. You need to follow up. And and then in certain galleries, you know, they'll be like, you know, your work's great, but it's not a good fit for us. You know, I often will tell, you know, artists where they might take their work if it's not going to fit kind of the genre of, of what we show at the gallery. So it's really just being a, a kind person, sort of. In a, yeah, sort and being, again, being respectful, which is something we're all hoping for these days because we've lost so much of, of people being civil, I hate to say. Sure. Um, so we really, you know, we expect it, we demand it, we offer it ourselves. Okay, I'm going to ask this question. Um, uh, 
Tim, how and Bill, how is a failure that you've come across, or you've you've done something and failed at it, been one of the biggest things you've learned from? Well, you know what's interesting. Uh, it's funny when that question comes up because that does come up uh, a fair bit, and I've certainly had my share of, of failures. But it's funny because I have to really reach for them. I mean. I'll put it a different way. Some of the things that really still fill me, fill, fill me with anxiety are things that we chose not to do, um, but you know may have been close to doing or uh, maybe on the brink of doing. And uh, one example that comes to mind was the Baltimore Orioles were wooing us for uh, a little while and uh, treating us like you know celebrities and and uh, really showing us uh, an amazing. Uh, um, you know, uh, outpouring of we want you here. And this was in a time where they had rebranded, where they had uh, redone everything and it looked really great. And my goodness, I grew up a, an Orioles fan and so I could see us there. And uh, I, we were so close to doing it and moving some of our best people out there. And it's still, it's just uh, so anxiety when I think about it because I'm so glad we didn't do it. It's not who we are as a company, um, and we didn't let our ego, you know, drive that decision. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we, we made the right decision in the end, which was not to do it. Any mistakes made on the corporate culture, uh, Bill? I've been trying to come up with a, a, an example, and I, I don't. I can I don't, answer. I can answer. This. <laughs> Excuse me, I can answer this question 50 different ways. Every time I ask, every time I ask it, nobody has an answer. It's unbelievable. Well, I mean, I'm just, what is wrong with me? Well, it's funny. Um, I had an experience years and years ago before I had my gallery, and I was trying to get my work into a gallery in New York. So back then, you had slides, and you walked around, and, you know, I try to hit openings and try to do the right thing. And um, I went into this gallery that we had this communication back and forth, and they said to me... Um, we love your work. We will buy everything you do. You no longer can be represented by anybody else in the whole country. Um, and this is really early on, first five years of painting full time. Um, and I left New York, came back to Baltimore, because I moved to Baltimore when I married my husband. So that's what brought me to Baltimore. And I didn't realize how much I had actually fallen in love with Baltimore and had already started to develop my clients that I met on the street while painting and, you know, didn't have my gallery, but I already had work around and I was starting to get known, be known. And, and I went back to Baltimore and I was like, I am not selling my soul to New York City. Nice. Now, I'd probably be a lot richer if I had sold my soul <laughs> to New York City, but I, I guess I'm probably like all of us, a bit of a control freak and hands on. And I really am so glad that I kept it local. Mm. Um, you know. Could I ask, uh, how diverse is your uh, customer base? <sighs> it's probably not that diverse. It's getting more diverse all the time. Um, and it's See, I think there is a huge opportunity there. Right. Um, yeah, to present the in art and the expression of life and why that should be important to black people, to Hispanics, um, to begin to, you know, generate uh, interest. Um, I think it's a huge untapped market. And I think there are ways to, you know, market uh, into that. What, what, what do you mean, Bill? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Crystal, go ahead. I was just going to say, and I know you're referring to diversity, you know, with different cultures, but the other diversity that we're starting to see is just age. Um, yeah. uh, we are, our clients, mo for years we kept ha hearing, oh, I love everything in here, but I have no wall space anymore, right? Because yeah. everybody's, you know, 50, 60, 70. Um, but now we are having the 30-year-olds. I don't know what's happened in this past two years, but people are walking in the gallery every week that I've never known. Yeah. And they're like, and we have nothing on our walls. So I I'm like... I have to share the story of my... That I told you before we came on, but we have, um, we, having been involved in plein air for 17 years, uh, my wife and I have more art than we have wall space, <laughs> and uh, we've started giving it to our, our kids, three daughters, and uh, my wife was talking to our youngest daughter uh, the other day, saying, you know, if plein air is here, 
and we have too many paintings. We've got great paintings. We had put it in a drawer. We have no wall space. Why don't you tell me what you want? And she said, Mom, um, just put my name on a piece of art that I can inherit, that I can take to the antique roadshow. <laughs> so, right, right. <laughs> she had that value already set in her hair. <laughs> right. And she's in her 30s. <laughs> there you go, there you go. I was just going to mention, uh, you know, to your point of, you know, a different audience, one thing we've been, you know, thrilled to see the full demographic of, of folks. And, uh, but during uh, the COVID times, I really feel like, COVID sort of worked to distill for folks what was important to them. Um, you see, I've heard this uh, from other friends that folks reinvesting in their homes, doing different projects that they hadn't gotten to for years. Uh, but also, I think, you know, these uh, quality cup of coffee, may I say, or, you know, these things uh, that were important prior to COVID became more important during COVID as we needed these lifelines, these things that gave us solace, and uh, thankfully, um, one of those has been for us, you know, rise up that, that folks, uh, uh, a stronger connection. I remember this time last year, kind of knowing that we were going to survive COVID, but not knowing exactly to what, you know, percentage rise up would ever return to what it was prior to. And I was totally fine with it being 50% or 75%. Well, it's not that. It's not 100%. It's actually 125%. Uh, in many places, uh, many of our locations uh, higher than that. And, and that uptick on the online orders has stayed where it was last year. So it's like it just intensified, I feel like, people's connection with, uh, you know, the things. I know it did for me, and it seems like it. So you think that's maybe what's happening with the people coming in looking for the so. art? Yeah, I've, I've heard this from, uh, I have a friend who has a really beautiful gallery in Rehoboth Beach, mm -hmm. and he just, you know, of course, we were all sort of uh, devastated and in, in, in shambles, you know, this time last year and not knowing. I mean, you hear about um, uh, what's happened in real estate, but for him at his, uh, uh, you know, showroom, it's just gone crazy. He can't. Uh, keep enough in stock, you know, for the amounts of... Well, listen, I, I would, I cannot, as Jessica would kill me if I didn't take this opportunity. Tim is telling you, this is, the Planner Easton is the perfect place to come down and do, you know, to, 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 you know, find something that's important to you that, you know, and that, yeah, I, I don't, I can't get too far into that, but Tim, I think it's exactly right. Like, I'm wondering when that's going to wear off. And I, I'm, I'm, my guess is that for another summer, we'll be in this sort of melancholy sort of, of mindset, but then the world will take over. That's just my guess. Um, but yeah, it, it, very well. well. What about millennials? Are the, you know, with these 30-year-olds that are coming in to buy paintings in, 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 in both Rehoboth and Baltimore? And uh, you want, I know you wanted to talk well, about I, that change. I... I Again, as we said earlier, millennials now make up half the population. And um, they are, as some reports, uh, you know, uh, in the next few years, going to in inherit uh, a huge amount of wealth, uh, which is going to put them in a position to be able to buy art, um, unless Joe Biden taxes all of that away. And that was not a political comment. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, maybe you can X that out. <laughs> um, and I, I do think that, uh, as we were saying earlier, that millennials connect with many issues, uh, particularly climate change and sustainability and all of that. And to the extent that that can be reflected in plein air art, um, I think is a, is a good way to develop, um, uh, you know, uh, that that market uh, to appeal to their uh, interest. Um, I wanted to, I know... Oh, I'm sorry, yes. We're Bill, getting short on time. And I, I no, you're, we're not short on time. We, we're okay. We're okay. Go ahead. Well, um, we have talked about social media and for artists and others who are viewing this and are thinking about how to expand their brand and how to grow a, a business, social media um, has to be considered. And I wanted to share... I don't know a lot about this, so that's why I did some research for uh, this uh, conversation that, that we're having. 
And I wanted to share with you a source that I, I found online. And if you would write this down, it's, it's buffer.com, B-U-F-F-E-R.com. And uh, Buffer has a, a, a library. Um, um, this one um, talks about 21 top social media sites. What's uh, number 13? Say again. What's number 13? <laughs> number 13? 13. Well, I have to look for it. Um, uh, 14. 14. 13 is Reddit. Uh, Reddit has 330 million um, yeah, annual users. Uh, What's the last one? The, the 21st one. <laughs> Yeah. Hold on. Sorry. 18th is Pinterest. 19th wow, is Line. Is Pinterest. That makes me curious as to what's um, number one. Yeah. Facebook. Telegram is 20. And Medium um, is 21, 60 million. But Facebook is right at the at the top. Why is that important to you, Bill? Why are those numbers? When you keep the 60 million, what, what, what would you do with that? Well, I'm just saying that uh, these are audiences uh, that are accessible by individuals and small businesses, um, you know, to begin to build awareness of, of a brand or a person or a talent or an art form. Um, and um, this um, site, Buffer.com, Buffer Buffer um, is they have a marketing director who put this together and... Um, uh, there are a lot of good tips in here about how to use these. You've things. read it and you trust that. Yeah, I, and I, I decided to print it out, uh, but I just wanted to pass on. I'm going to definitely have to take that from it, you when you when you leave here today, for sure. It's, and and there, there are many other books, of course, that have been written, but this is a bit online and available to anybody, so I just want to share that with what you. What book would you give someone if they were looking to I get it? I don't know the books. You, the marketing books now? No. Tim, do you take, uh, you, are you involved in your posts when you? Oh, very much so. I can't, I cannot uh, hand it off, really. I, I, um, I think uh, folks would be uh, amazed as to uh, still how hands-on I am with that. Just because I, I really believe while the photographs on uh, most of these platforms are the most important piece, I just, you know, for me, the context, the words have to be Correct, and uh, you know we've we've tried it a few different ways, but uh, for right now, this is this is the only way that allows me to uh, kind of sleep at night with with our social media. That uh, I still stay very hands on about it. I think one thing is that uh, we live in this beautiful age where everybody's carrying one of these incredible devices that uh, uh, work like pretty okay as phones, but they're great, uh, great cameras. And, uh, and we, we have this uh, really photogenic, I mean, coffee is beautiful. Uh, you know, on the rude side of things, the, the food that we create is, is also, you know, beautiful. And so um, we do invest in the photographs that are taken by way of uh, uh, really great, uh, you know, talented uh, photographers. But uh, and then I kind of wordsmith it and put it out there that way. I will say that, you know, this is constantly evolving, and I think about our time uh, in business and how, you know, for us, we were all in on Facebook. It's funny because when I think about our social media presence right now, uh, Facebook is, is uh, a very small uh, part of that. Yes, we are uh, keeping it fresh and keeping it updated. Yeah. But... Uh, I, I kind of feel like, in some ways, because of, of the point that was made earlier, that there's so much coming at you on Facebook, it's it's almost too overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and these platforms that have distilled it down to just the image, uh, you know, like Instagram, of course, uh, like Pinterest, uh, you know, I think is is more sort of where people are, where they can just flip like that, TikTok and those. Um, but it's a wild time. I mean, the, it is. the idea that you put out a post and, you know, it goes viral or, and, and we've had that happen to a small degree with, with Rise Up, but you just never know what's going to, you know, catch, catch 
catch fire out there. Sure, it's sure. Really a wild time. Bill, I want to go back to this real thing, real quickly, if you can. How would you market to diversity when you were saying you were saying you think you can market art to to diverse populations? How would you are you proposing to do that? Well, I don't, I don't have a specific answer uh, to that. Sure. I think. Um, um, because it maybe to go to you know um, through churches through others you know to develop relationships um, um, and I, in in the case of of healthcare which I'm spending a lot of time on I, I'm involved in the strategic planning committee. Uh, Did they call you about the shot, Bill? Johnson uh, and Johnson. Did they call you about the shot? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm involved in Shore Health. Uh, and, Shore Health here. Yeah, gotcha. and um, uh, they have adopted a planning model that um, is based on patient health, um, which means that they are taking responsibility for uh, everyone in the community, whether they have health insurance or not. And um, health literacy, illiteracy, is a very big issue right now. So many people don't understand how much is going on in health, and and we need to do uh, focus groups to reach out to various communities, not to tell them what to do, but to hear their questions and to learn from them, and, and so that we can lead people to, to develop focus groups. Right thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and I think um, that same strategy uh, could uh, be done with with art. Now, Plenaire Easton has done a terrific job through the schools here in Easton of uh, making sure that. You know, every child has an opportunity, uh, you know, to have some exposure to that. And that, you know, if you work through those children and you provide opportunities for them to show their work, that gets back to their families. That's another way see, of, of growing mm -hmm. um, a diverse interest in, um, in plein air art. Um, but, That's you know, it's, it's different community by community. Uh, but I have high praise for what Al and Jess and the Avalon family. I'm going to get back to you on that. This is going to be the last question I ask. I'm going to ask two more questions. Um, or maybe just one. Crystal and Tim, this is a repeat. You may have had this one before, too. Um, if you could have a billboard, one billboard, that could say anything on it that to be seen by, what would it, what would it be? Um, boy, nothing like being put on the spot. Um, I th Tim, you know the answer to that one? I do, actually. actually think about it for a second, Crystal. Jump in. in. Well, I actually uh, fairly recently met uh, one of my coffee heroes, maybe my coffee hero. Um, and it was one of these things where um, uh, it was unexpected, but there he was, and I thought uh, I'd be a fool not to go say hello. So anyway, track him down, and... Uh, it was, it was uh, pre-COVID, so we were at this uh, coffee conference, and he's a tall drink of water, so I saw him up in the crowd, and I'm running after him. And I finally catch up to him, and I didn't realize that uh, they also had a booth at this same show. And he arrived at his booth, and he was descended upon by so many folks, you know, from all corners. I said, oh, man, I missed my opportunity. But I tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, hey, uh, just to say hello here, I'm, I'm Tim from Rise Up back there around the corner. I appreciate all you're doing in, in coffee, and, and here's our coffee, just, and said some words. And, and he said, uh, wait, you're Rise Up back there around the corner? And I said, yes, you know, that's, that's us. And he said, I want to go. I want to go see it. And I said, oh, sure, man, we'll be here all weekend. You know, I can't wait to show it to you and come by the, he's like, no, I want to go right now. And uh, I said, whoa, wow, well, it's a ways back there. And he said, no, we're going. So. Anyway, we start walking back to uh, the Rise Up booth, and he says to me, the very first question my coffee hero says to me, he says, uh, all right, so all the stars align, all your wildest dreams come true for Rise Up. What does that look like? Which is essentially what you've just asked. And I kind of like you, I was like, whoa, uh, man, what does that look like? It kind of looks like this, you know, what's happening right now. But I said, uh, it would mean that we made a huge difference, you know, that Rise Up actually meant something to, you know, I, I don't know, to people, to our customers, to 
others that are not directly related to me, that kind of thing. And, and you know, from the get-go, it's always, it's always been the, uh, like I said, Rise Up has connected to, you know, see our, you know, T-shirts, our, you know, stickers out in the wild. And, like, you can see, I mean, it's emotional for me still. You know, it's, like, such a thrill. And it obviously, you know, has meant more than just a cup of coffee, which, you know, is pretty special. Are you into Keurig cups yet? Oh, well, we did just cross over into Keurig cups, and uh, very proud of that. It took a while for the science to catch up to our ethos on that. So we, for years and years and years, stayed on the sidelines of, of uh, you know, K-cups. Um, but 60-some percent of, you know, U.S. homes have a Keurig, and... Uh, so, I just bought a new one on the way over here today. All right, so ours, <laughs> you know, ours are, uh, we're very proud. They're, you know, recyclable, compostable, and... Uh, where, where can I get them? Right down the street. Or, <laughs> I will. Or riseupcoffee.com, if I may. Uh, okay. You can order them online. But, yeah, uh, so we're very proud of that. We just, you know, it's, it's wild to be 16 years into it and have a new widget, you know? Yeah. So, I, I got to tell you, just for honesty's sake, like... And I told Tim this years ago because, you know, he actually came up to me one time and it was, I don't know, five years, six years ago. He's like, well, Tim, he says, I never really see you in Rise Up. And I was like, I was, I was like, he wouldn't say it like that way. He was just like, he was just curious. And I was like, Tim, I've had one cup of coffee my whole life. I've not, I don't, I've not, I had it, I was going up a mountain in West Virginia to wake up and because we were going snow skiing and it really woke me up. But I've never had a cup of coffee other than well, that my whole life. Reason. So I don't even know what a Keurig is. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, you should go to uh, riseupcoffee.com sure. to get one. I would think, suggest. Well, can I get it on, on Dover Street? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll get your address. I'll send it right to you. Oh. Uh, billboard? What's your billboard? Uh, you, know, you have some time now. Uh, uh, yeah, Christian. I mean, just like art matters, I think, is would be the message that I would want to get across and whether it's you know for the artists themselves who are creating it for you know we we have um you know where my little gallery is i'm on the board of the business association i'm involved you know i literally grab kids walking from their school home and bring them into the gallery and then they bring two more and they bring four more and you know yeah so this is like my it's so important i have this one, this one kid who i've known since he was this tall and now he's taller than i am and he'll bring in like four friends and they'll be they'll be like what are we doing? Yeah, they don't you know, think they're going to dig it, but this, then they end up and, digging. And he's like, this is where I come in to chill. And like, and nice. he'll literally come in and he'll either talk up a storm or he'll just sit there and look around. And so it's, it is so important. I, I remember painting on the street years and years ago in Federal Hill. And, um, and these two kids were obviously, you know, skipping school. And I just said, you guys should be in school because you could be learning how to do this. And they were like, we don't have that. This is when they cut out all the art in the school. And I, and they said, we don't have art in school. And I was like, good. Then you sit down right here and you stay here for the next hour and watch me paint, you know? Um, right. And that's, that's what I mean. Art matters. I mean, yeah. you know, I had to laugh when they closed us down for the two months, whatever, nine weeks last year. And cause we were non-essential and I'm like, how can we be non-essential? Yeah. I had you know? some friends who were, were kind of cried or they found that their job wasn't essential or whatever, which is... Yeah. Totally well, and I, I mean, bogus, I get it. But... Again, small gallery, but, you know, we just had a client who's been a long-time client, and they live, like, four blocks from the gallery. And they came in last week, and they bought a painting, um, actually a, a couple weeks ago, Bernie Delario painting, who's a who's an artist here in Yeah, he's coming here. Yeah. And um, uh, and this big painting, and, and they came in, and they just, they loved it. And they just came back, and they said, you know, we looked around our house, every painting but one we've bought from this gallery. And they bought, like, a dozen paintings. Mm -hmm. And, they're, and, and they're, they're like, and we just don't want you to go away, because people during the pandemic, they're just, they're nervous for the few little... It's like what you guys were talking about before. Have. Yeah, they're worried that, it, and I'm like, well, thanks to you, we're <laughs> we're not going to go anywhere. No plans yet. Um, but uh, art matters. Art, art matters, which is a perfect segue into Bill. Your final question is: You've been supporting this in a big way for 17 years. Why is this plein air festival? How does it align with all your core values? Why is this such an important event to you? Well, when we we lived in New Jersey uh, for the, the entire time I was working, and then we moved down here 
uh, full time in 2005, and it was, we were totally new to the community. And we were looking for ways that we could contribute to uh, the uh, community. We met Nancy Tankersley, and um, uh, she was talking about what she wanted to do. I had heard the term, but I really wasn't familiar with it. And um, uh, but we thought it had great potential because uh, the landscape here and the history um, in Talbot County and the Eastern Shore um, is rich with opportunity uh, for, um, you know, the, the eyes of painters. So um, in the very first year, um, the uh, judges for uh, the competition stayed with us. and We provided housing for them, and we have provided housing for artists, free housing, mm -hmm. uh, every year since, and we contribute uh, money to it as well. And one of the early things that we wanted to see was... Uh, art interest to be developed into the schools, and, and Al and Jess have, have, have done that. And um, we, my wife and I, Doris, uh, we really, you know, we were looking for a way to make a meaningful contribution to our new community. Wonderful. And Plein Air Easton, uh, I kept saying, I, I wish we could call it Plein Air Talbot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it right. Really has, yeah. you know, an uh, impact There's your marketing the entire county. Right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> Right. But we've been um, overjoyed with the the staff that's been put together, the hard work of the volunteers. It's just been amazing. And so we're very happy to be involved. Well, we certainly appreciate your support. And, and uh, one thing, Tim, I'm going to ask you one last thing. What, what main piece of advice would you give anybody looking at branding and marketing? Um, real quickly, like what's... Uh, I would say, I mean, you know, uh, you got to stay humble. Uh, for me, I mean, that's been the biggest piece is uh, trying to figure out uh, what I don't know, and, and there's plenty of that. So, um, you know, staying humble, listening uh, is a huge one. Uh, I think that, um, you know, with, with Rise Up, basically, you know, we've been just trying to, the connection piece, but by way of authenticity, really. I mean, it's, it's you know, something that we're, you know, incredibly proud of, every aspect, uh, you know, all the people involved. So it's simply, I can't believe, you know, I, I don't often commit to doing uh, these kind of things because I don't really like the spotlight on me. I like to kind of say, look at the, you know, look at the coffee, look at the people, look at the process, you know, that kind of thing. So. Really take the ego out of it, stay humble about it, and, and you know, lead with authenticity, I would say. Well said. Very well said. Yeah. We're going to leave it right there. Uh, we want to thank Crystal Mall, Tim Carradine, and Bill Nielsen for being a part of this today. Branding and marketing, uh, 2001 Plenary Easton. Tomorrow we're going to have Pete Lesher, Cassandra Van Huser, and Mary Kellogg from the Tillman <laughs> Island Waterman's Museum. And we're going to talk about art as a historical record. Uh, I don't know what kind of questions I'm going to have for those guys, because I don't know anything about that. <laughs> but um, this is, if there's interesting as these folks, it would be a great conversation. That's tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Thank you guys very much for coming. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you all yeah. for watching. We'll see you next time. Okay. All right.